Welcome back to the shop. In this video, I'll show you how I made stackable trays with dividers and lids. My brother is a rock hound. He collects mineral specimens in mass, both through purchasing and getting out in the field and collecting them himself. He talked to me about an idea he had to build trays to hold part of his collection. After I did some prototyping in Fusion 360, I came up with a design that we were both happy with. Let's get started. I began by preparing some red oak I had in the shop. I started by cleaning up an edge on the jointer. Next, I ripped pieces two and a quarter inches wide. Since I used two different source pieces of oak, I measured the thinner piece and brought the other parts to the same thickness over at the planer. I was careful to cut one end and one side from each part. This let the grain wrap around the inside corner where the parts meet. With the joinery I used, it doesn't matter nearly as much as if I were using mitered corners. After a quick mock-up of position, I marked the edges that would receive a groove to accept the tray bottom. To cut the grooves, I put just one side of my dado stack in the table saw. I borrowed a fence from my router table so I could have both feather boards in play. This would help keep the piece up against the fence and get a consistent depth of cut. After running all the parts through once, I used a test piece to set up the fence to get a nice fit on the groove. After that, each piece went through the setup one more time. Since the sides were a little long, I found the center line and measured 9 inches out from each side. I then set my marking gauge to that line and marked all the sides. This both helped me mark the parts as well as limit tear out as I cut them on the table saw. I used a much wider dado setup to speed through the cutting of these joints. After rough assembly, I took measurements of the ends of the trays. They were wider than I wanted, which means I either cut the rabbit deeper or I trimmed the edges shorter. I chose to trim the ends. With the boxes clamped in place, I measured to figure out the dimensions of the tray bottoms. Since all four sides would be captured by the grooves, I didn't bother adding blue tape, since any tear out would be hidden. Before gluing the tray together, I wanted to be able to drill the sides for the handles. So I shifted direction to make the handles and the feet. I found an incredibly warped piece of walnut that I've been keeping around the shop, and I used it in small sections. After milling up smaller parts, I ripped the feet blanks to width. I then calculated where to set the fence, so when I cut these in half at a 15 degree angle, I would be left with two near identical shapes. I then trimmed the feet to length with a crosscut sled. If I were to do this over again, I'd cut them a little shorter than the inside width of the trays. When the trays nest, they don't need to lock in place with an exact fit, they just need to keep each other from sliding around. Having a little slop would have made fitting the trays together much easier. Next, I cut up a blank to use for the tray handles, and a thinner piece for the handles for the lid I'd make later in the project. After sketching a general shape and finding the center, I used a V-bit in the router to set the fence. I then swapped out to an inch and a half core box bit to form a cove. I set the table saw to 10 degrees and ran each side of the blank through the blade. Finally, I returned the saw to 90 degrees and ripped the blank in half. I cut the handles to 4 inches in length and then set about finding where I wanted to mount them on the sides. I figured out how far I would need to countersink the panhead screws and mark the wood. I used that mark to set the depth stop on my drill press, and then drilled in the countersink before drilling the main holes the whole way through. I had a plan for how I would shape the bottom feet using a router and some stop blocks, but after a few tests and unhappy results, I changed direction. I ended up clamping the feet together, forming a V profile along the length. I then carefully used a Forstner bit to drill two holes centered on the seam. I connected the holes over at the bandsaw before smoothing it out over at the belt sander and spindle sander, also known as my drill press. Due to the outside temperature at the time of filming, I did the glue up in the house and applied glue in all the grooves and corner joints. At this point, take special care that your box is completely square. I didn't, and I fought this fact that it was slightly out of square the rest of the project. I tried to use a block plane to trim the edges, 
I got a little better at it the more I tried it. I even added some water to the end grain to improve the cut, but I didn't escape without a little tear out. I used a chisel and some sandpaper to soften the edges. I wanted to reinforce the edges with dowels, and a test piece really helped me dial in the distance from the corners that I wanted. Once I had the dimensions down, I marked the locations of the dowels, and I used an awl to help get the drill started. I then figured out the depth I wanted to cut and used blue painter's tape to mark the bit. I use this drilling guide when freehanding a hole, and it does a good job of keeping the drill straight. I don't have a dowel plate, so I tried a bunch of variations on a theme to make dowels I needed from some walnut. In each case, I started with roughly quarter inch square stock, and then pounded and drilled it through a scrap of metal, and also that same drilling guide I mentioned earlier. The guide worked for the walnut, but it did get quite hot. In the end, the hole I drilled in a scrap piece of metal worked just fine. I did use a file to put little notches in the hole to help with the cutting. After the dowels were made, I used a jig to cut them to length using a pull saw. To make sure the glue would have room to escape, I used a pair of pliers to crimp the dowels before gluing them in place. After using a mallet to seat the dowels, I tried to remove some of the squeeze out from the glue. I totally forgot to put down blue tape before drilling the holes, as that would have made the cleanup a breeze. After the dowels were dry, I trimmed a few of them using the pull saw, but ended up just using the bandsaw as that was much faster. I already had the holes drilled in the sides, but I didn't have the holes drilled in the handles. To hold them in place, I cobbled together this monstrosity using some oak wedges, a scrap of cheap plywood, and some walnut offcuts. The end result was a jig that let me hold the handles in place while I pre-drilled them, and then screwed them into place. Even with the jig, the angle of the holes could be different enough that I marked each handle with a letter and marked each set of holes with the same letter so I could match them up again later. You can save yourself a step here and instead of using painter's tape, just mark the letter directly behind where the handles will be attached. I ended up doing this later before finishing. I sanded the boxes in preparation of finish. To break sharp edges, I love using the micro zip sander by Gator Finishing. I used a small Japanese block plane and sandpaper to finish shaping the handles. Take care if you're planning small pieces like this and keep your fingers away from the blade. The micro zip came in handy here as well. When I glued the feet in, I clamped them tight to the sides of the trays. I probably would not do this again and would instead space them one or two playing cards away from the side, letting the glue along the top give it strength. With a fit this tight, I ended up having to do a lot of sanding both now and later to refine the fit of the feet. I ended up making the dividers about a quarter inch thick. I resawed walnut into thin strips and then brought them to consistent thickness using the planer. I used the thickness of a single dado blade as my target. I ripped them to about an inch and three eighths high over at the table saw. After I had them all cut, I cleaned up the cut marks using a card scraper. Next, I cut them all to length using the table saw sled and set about figuring out the spacing I would need. I understand the appeal of dividers or other relative measuring tools, but sometimes I just like using exact measurements and math to figure out what I need. I whipped up a quick fence for my miter gauge and used a stop lock to figure out the needed position. I lined up all the parts and clamped them together before pushing them through the blade. I could use each setup to cut two slots before changing the position of the stop lock. I repeated the same process on the long dividers as well. After the first set of dividers were cut, I realized the notch wasn't quite tall enough, so I raised the blade a bit and ran the cross dividers through again. There was only three cuts on those. <laughs> 
To get the plexiglass, I took a road trip about 30 minutes up to Robinson True Value Hardware Store. This hardware store existed in Cass County for 98 years and had been in the same family for around 80 years. All of these dates are past tense for a reason, as this local landmark closed at the end of June. At the time of filming, the upcoming closure was the biggest reason why capturing footage of the owner was important to me. Jack was so helpful and kind to me, and when he found out I had a YouTube channel, he watched my videos and took time to comment and tell his customers about me. Jack worked at this hardware store for 44 years, owning it for 25 years before retiring this summer. I think that's pretty incredible. Okay, back to the project. He used a wall-mounted scoring tool to cut the plexiglass before giving it to me to use in the project. Thank you, Jack. The plexiglass needed to be shortened just a bit. I haven't worked with it much and was really worried about chip out. So the first lid, I marked lines and used sanding equipment to bring it into size. For the second lid, I did some test cuts with a high tooth count blade and found if I raised the blade the whole way up, it reduced the amount of chipping I was seeing. This was the way to go, as the only sanding I had to do was to clean up the marks from the table saw and provide a bullnose. You can use a torch to flame polish the edges, but I found this thin plexiglass also warped a bit when hit with a flame. In the end, I got good results wet sanding the edges with various grits, working my way up to 2000. I then used some polishing compound and a buffing wheel in my drill press to give the edges a great look and feel. I had used a Dremel buffing wheel on the first lid, but that was a lot harder to control. For the handles on the lids, I used a very small walnut blank, passing it over the router to establish the inside of the handle. Next, I used a roundover bit on the outside edges before refining the shape at the belt sander. I used a small sanding drum in my Dremel to sand the inside curves. Next, I ripped the blank in half over at the table saw. I cut these handles to three inches long and gave them a good sanding. I used a Danish oil finish on the handles and the walnut dividers. I just love the look of an oil finish with walnut. For the trays, I tried water-based polyurethane. I used a shop-made Lazy Susan to help with spraying the trays. To sand between coats, I used a brown paper bag. I can't remember who shared that tip with me, but it worked great to knock down the rough parts and give the tray a smooth feel. I even used it on the handles to smooth them out after the Danish oil dried. I decided I didn't like the bright silver Craig screws in this application and bought black screws instead. They were slightly wider than the holes I drilled, so I used my drill and my belt sander to narrow the width before installing the handles. To glue the smaller handles to the plexiglass, I used a cutting mat as the measuring tool. After finding center and measuring out, I scored lines and then sanded to scuff up the plexiglass. I also sanded the very bottom of the handles to remove the layer of finish, which I hoped would help the glue work better. I applied a small layer of super glue and then held the handle in place over the correct measurement. It's a good idea to keep the protective covers on the plexiglass until the end of the project. Applying the finish made the fit even tighter on the trays, so I masked off the tray sides and did some more sanding of the feet. I then carefully applied some more poly to the sanded areas. Once I brought the trays inside from my humid shop, the fit got a lot better as the wood dried out. This was a fun project where I got to try some new techniques and learn a little about plexiglass. My brother was kind enough to send me some cool mineral specimens for the final photos. One unexpected bonus is the plexiglass top makes for awesome pictures of these minerals. If you have any ideas about things I could have done differently or things that would have made this process easier, I'd love to hear them, so please leave a comment below. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up, consider sharing it with your friends, and to my brother John, if you build these, good luck. I did my best to over-engineer, I mean, add details to these designs. I hope you like them, and I hope they get a lot of use. Mm -hmm.